Uh, this is L, and of course you're on the L Medic View. I have former Chief of Police Ralph Godby on here today, and we're going to talk about crime in Detroit. So, a few questions. We're not going to keep you guys long, but I definitely feel like this is something that we have to talk about. Have to get a tackle on here in the city, and this is definitely going to be some vital and important information. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am good. So, my first question is. What sparked your interest in law enforcement? Like, what prompted you to be a police officer? <laughs> I did it on a dare, actually. Wow. Uh, I was 18 at Wayne State University with my best friend, Bobby Gordon. And uh, we got super drunk one night. And he dared, we dared each other to go sign up for the police department. Uh, long story short, I went down to sign up. He didn't. And 22 years later, I was the chief of police. Wow. So, so it wasn't one of those things like, you know, I grew up, I wanted to be the police. Um, but, you know, God works in mysterious ways, you know, took me out of, as a foolish boy uh, <laughs> and it turned out to be a great career for me. So you said, I'm, I'm a man, I'm going to stick to my word. I'm going to stick to my word. You to that dare. I wanted to dare. I wanted to bet. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I got into it and they recruited me and I went through the process, uh, it turned out to be a great fit for me. Wow. That's different. I was not, I was not expecting I knew you would. I was not expecting would. that. What was your degree in? What were you going to Wayne State for? Uh, actually, I was uh, to party. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I wasted so much of my mom and dad's money. I just graduated from Cass Tech. I actually went to Indiana University to play football. Uh, Bloomington is not Detroit. Right. Uh, so I came home. I enrolled in Wayne State. Uh, I intended to play football there. But uh, me and my boy Bobby, we hung out so much. I had thought about being a cap. I mean, every, all the wrong reasons. Uh, it, I, that, that was just too close to home. But uh, after we had our little bet, and I did admit to underage drinking, <laughs> but y'all can't get me now. Right. But, you know, um, I went down, I signed up, and it became a great career. Wow, that's different. Yeah. Okay. So, you were. The chief of police is elected. No, he's appointed. He's appointed. Uh, okay, right. I was appointed by uh, Detroit Mayor Dave Bing, who was the mayor at the time. Uh, he appointed me chief of police after uh, being in the department 22 years. Uh, I rose to the level of assistant chief. I was the number two uh, under the first female chief in department history, uh, Ella Billy Cummings. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she retired, and uh, we know what happened with former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, he, uh, he resigned eventually. We know he was convicted. Uh, but I left the department and uh, I started my own security consultant firm. And my first client was Alan Ezell Iverson. <laughs> so he tra he got trained to the Pistons and uh, he was my first client. Wow. And uh, I did security for him while he was here in Detroit. We became great friends. Uh, and then about 10 months later, uh, Dave Bing uh, asked Warren Evans to be chief of police and asked me to come back to be the assistant chief of police. And then once he? And then once he, uh, a year later, uh, he relieved Warren of his duties and then he asked me to be chief of police. So you came into the city when it was all this ruckus. There was so much really going on in the politics of Detroit. Yeah, but you know, I grew up that way. Uh, and what I mean by, you know, from Coleman, 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 the late Coleman A. Young, the greatest mayor Detroit has ever seen. Uh, he was the mayor at the time uh, when I joined the police department. I started off as a police officer on the street and um, you know, I've been very, very blessed in my career. A good friend of mine, uh, Mark Young, we were in the police academy together. Uh, in 19, I was the class president. Uh, I was the top shooter, top academic. Uh, <laughs> Jack of Jack And, you know, I, I gave the, uh, I recited the uh, Law Enforcement Code of Ethics at the graduation, which is an honor bestowed on one of the students. And uh, he told me, he said, man, you're going to be chief of police one day. And that's when I was 19 years old. Um, but, it, you know, God has a, you know, a plan for your life sometimes and, you know, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy and eventually I became Chief of Police. What was your goal when you became Chief of Police? And when I became Chief of Police it was to really touch the community uh, and particularly gay, engage with young black and brown men. My focus wasn't about how many folks we can arrest okay. um, because if you look at the over-incarceration of black folks, the disproportionate number of contacts, uh, particularly black and brown men have with the police, I felt a different obligation. I'm from the hood. I'm from the east side of Detroit, born and raised. And, you know, both my parents were at home, but we grew up in a middle class um, neighborhood in northeast Detroit in Cranes Woods, right outside of Coney Gardens. Okay. And um, I saw so many young black men that didn't make it out. And, but I came from a time when the gangbangers, they, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to slang, I wanted to be a part of a gang. Because I thought that was cool. 
Um, and I had a father at home, but those cats told me, they like, look, man, you're an athlete, you know, your dad's at home, you got parents. Uh, we, we'll handle this. And that's not you go to like school. That, that big homie thing. Your big yeah. homie really isn't your big homie if he's encouraging you to do the right, wrong thing. Right. And they felt like I had a path out. You know, I was, a, you know, I was an excellent athlete. I played football. I played for Northeast Detroit, Sharon Rocks, the East Side Cowboys. Uh, then I played uh, quarterback at Cass Tech. Um, you know, played there, started there three years. Uh, went to college to play, but I came home. Uh, Cause I just didn't, you know, I just kind of lost. I wasn't gonna get no big house. Right. Uh, so I thought I'd have a, a better career move might be just to come home and go to school. But, but that was smart of you. That, well, it, that wasn't, you know, I just. Cause some people take that dream and just don't know what they're gonna do outside of that. They're so stuck yeah. on football or so stuck on that. Right. But so. my, my, my dad's dream for me because he, his father died when he was 11 and my dad had to drop out of high school to go into the army. He was the third youngest of 17. Wow. His father died at 11. Uh, they owned a business, a uh, guy beat construction companies to build houses. But when my grandfather died, um, you know, it came full of time. My grandmother was a housewife. She, she didn't know how to run the business and they lost the business. Uh, there were six younger children still in the home. Uh, he had to make a, a, a choice. So he dropped out of school, joined the army, but he always wanted me and my brother to go to college. So he was more concerned about me getting a degree than mm -hmm. playing football mm -hmm. because that was a dream that he wasn't able to realize. And so he was able to realize it through me. That's a blessing though. And he was able to see you. He was able to see me become chief of police. Thank you. you know, that was um, that was a very, very proud moment for him. Uh, you know, pictures all over his uh, assistant living home. We're hearing my mom were the pictures with the president and pictures here and pictures there. He was proud. Oh my God. You can, you know, he was gonna let everybody know that his son was <laughs> yeah, it wasn't gonna be no question about that with him. So you spoke on Coming Young, and I yes. was, so definitely wanna get so what are your thoughts on the Coming Young here? A lot of people like to compare Kwame mm -hmm. and Kwame Young and there's no comparison. Yeah, there's to no comparison. And that's that's you know, that's not any shade on Kwame. No, no, because I, I still love my marriage. I, I, I love I love <laughs> Kwame Malik Kilpatrick, I always will. I was promoted several times under his leadership. Um, it's unfortunate the way things ended for him. But Coleman Young, you know, people have tried to rewrite his legacy as if he was a criminal. I hate when I hear people, mm -hmm. especially those of the other uh, persuasion, our, 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 our European brothers and sisters from another mother, that try and portray him as a criminal. He was investigated by the FBI, DEA, ATF. I mean, every major alphabet you can think of and they couldn't find anything, only not because he was that slick, but because he was a good man. Right. He believed in the law, but he was raised in an era of Jim Crow. And he was a part of the union movement, the labor movement. Mm -hmm. He survived McCarthyism and mm -hmm. being accused of being a communist. And, and he was not willing to take a back seat to anybody. He was a freedom fighter. And you know, for people to try to rewrite his legacy, when he came into power on the heels of uh, the riots in Detroit in 1967, there was a new charter. Um, he became mayor and the police department was not integrated. Uh, it did not reflect the community that it served. And he made it a point uh, through uh, affirmative action and other things to make sure that the police department more accurately reflected the comp composition of the community. But he was also very, very, very a stickler for his police department engaging with the community. Not just being an occupying army to come in, take somebody to jail and talk to people any kind of way. I mean, community relations, as we know it in the country now, we're talking about community policing, mm -hmm. many stations started here in Detroit. And those were the models that uh, uh, George Q. Wilson and folks of that ilk from criminology took. And now it's what we know now as community policing. That came under the Coleman Young administration, neighborhood city halls. You take government out to the community. These are things that were the mastermind of, I mean, he was just a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, uh, attribute things to him that had nothing to do uh, with his, um, uh, abil his several abilities. Uh, but he was literally a, a, a political genius. So speaking of community policing, mm -hmm. what do you think the issue is now with the community versus the police? Because now it's at it's us against you, or you against us type of thing. What do you think that issue is? I, I'm not going to talk about Detroit specifically. I'm talking about law enforcement. Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people get caught up in Detroit. But we get along good with our police department. 
Well, yes no. and no. Yes and no. Right. Because uh, right now this is a huge thing. The well, Black yeah. Lives Matter. The Black Lives thing. Matter has a point on a lot of things. But if you travel throughout the metro Detroit area, you travel anywhere else in the country, uh, Detroit is not necessarily the typical relationship that black people have with police. And sometimes I think living in Detroit, we kind of get jaded and think that, well, we got a board of police commissioners we can go to. We can complain. Well, you, you can do that in Detroit. But there are other communities that don't have them. You look at what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, you look at what happened to um, uh, 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 Eric Garner in New York, mm -hmm. when he was choked to death on camera and the whole world watched that. That's unfortunately more of the reality of what black people uh, deal with when they face the police as opposed to the re reality of Detroit. I'm very proud of my tenure in Detroit. I started at a point where we were on the two federal consent judgments and I took us from 19% compliance to 90% compliant. And when James Craig, who's the current chief, came in, now the Detroit Police Department is not under federal oversight. But if you notice, you haven't had the same nationally known images of just blatant disrespect and abuse that happened to black people in the city of Detroit. You don't see or hear about a number of things that you hear going on all across the country and they, they, they lock up some very dangerous folks. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a credit to, number one, good training. It's a credit to the fact that there's civilian oversight in the city of Detroit. But there's a culture of the police department is answerable to the community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just prior to me taking over as chief, I was assistant chief when Ayanna Stanley Jones was killed at the hands of the Detroit Police Department. And people were pissed. And, and they should be a nine-year-old child died um, and should not have. But the community has such a good relationship with the police department. They was pissed. Don't, they, they, mm -hmm. they, nothing takes that away. But they also had an understanding that there was a danger that that child was placed in. And I always say that. I feel like it was child endangerment. You have mm -hmm. sub, you have made your child a subject to mm -hmm. be in the house for a future, or you have a future. A future that was there. So you know this is a possibility. Right. It's unfortunate mm -hmm. that your child lost her life, mm -hmm. but at some point to take your fault as a parent, yeah. as a grandmother, mm -hmm. everybody in that house are the adults to make better decisions. Right. And some people, I think, weren't really understanding that. But I think a lot of people were. And then a mm -hmm. lot of people appreciated this. Um, I was assistant chief at the time that it happened, uh, and I was on, I mean, every major news organization across the country was covering this. We, we apologized. We owned it. Mm -hmm. We showed empathy towards the family um, that we understood that we made, a, we made a horrendous mistake. And I think most people understand that law enforcement is a tough job. But by the same token, when you mess up, just fess up. You ain't, you, there's nothing to cover up when you screw up. There's no rebuttal. You know, there's no rebuttal for mm -hmm. that. Even though the police were there legally, even though they were executing a search warrant to uh, bring in two very dangerous individuals that people, a lot of people forget that just uh, two days before, uh, a 17 year old was killed in cold blood, murdered. Uh, Jerry and Blake, he was murdered uh, by the men that they were looking, you know, that, that they were looking for. But it still doesn't excuse the fact that a child lost her life innocently. And we showed empathy, we talked about it, we didn't hide, we were transparent, we turned the investigation over to the prosecutor and to state police, and people had confidence that we did at least the right thing after it happened. Now, uh, uh, people may not have been satisfied with the results of the Joseph Weekly trial, who's the officer that was uh, pulled to trigger, but the fact is, he actually went to trial. Mm -hmm. You look at Ferguson, the officer never went to trial. You look at um, Eric Garner, the officer never went to trial. And that's the narrative that so many black people are subject to across the country that it doesn't even make it to a trial to find out uh, from a trial of fact whether the person is guilty. So the disconnect is is that most communities, the police is reigns precedence. They reign precedence. Right. You don't take the, uh, you, you don't give the community the benefit of the doubt. All of the benefit of the doubt goes to the police officer. And that's not, that's just, that's just not the way it should be. We haven't earned that. And uh, fortunately with uh, cell phone cameras and so many different cameras now, we can't, you know, <laughs> pull the okie doke no more. And I think it's a great thing with social media. These videos go viral. Uh, for less, uh, I feel like, uh, 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 in uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, the man who was killed on Facebook Live, uh, Philando Castile. Yeah. I mean, the entire world watched that man die alive. Yeah. So you can't cover those kind of things up. Yes.
that is it's, it's a different world. It's completely different. It's completely different. Something world. that we don't see, and when you, and especially mm -hmm. now, when people say history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. I just never thought it would repeat itself. But you know, you know what the difference is. These things have always been alleged to happen, and it's not that they're new, but now we see it. Because it's all, because it's, of social because media. of social media right. because mm -hmm. of technology. So where a lot of people will curse social media and say social media is the devil. I think the exact opposite. I think it creates more transparency because once something goes viral, you know, you can't sweep that under the rug. Right. You can't look at a police report, then you gotta take the person's word. And then unfortunately the police always want to vilify the person that's been shot. And they want to show you, you know, well, he stole bubble gum when he was in kindergarten. <laughs> something that has nothing and to do with that. Absolutely nothing to do with the um, you know, facts at hand. Mm -hmm. So to me, social media, cameras. Um, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So when you can see and there's transparency, uh, it takes a lot of those things off the, off the table. So speaking of that, what do you think of the term snitching? And so, many, so many times I feel like the word mm -hmm. is misinterpreted. What's well, misinterpreted? Because this is what a snitch is. Me and you go do some dirt. Okay? Right. Mm -hmm. And we out doing our dirt. Mm -hmm. We steal a car. We in a stolen car. You know, I happen to run faster than you. Right. So when the police stop us, we bail. I get away. They catch you because right. you ain't as fast as me. Well, when they catch you and you tell on me, that's snitching because we was doing dirt together. Exactly. Now, let's flip this. You know, somebody murders a, a, a child or rapes a woman in my neighborhood, and I know who did it. I'm not a party to that. I'm a responsible man as a king in my neighborhood. As a grown man in my neighborhood, I have a responsibility to protect children, protect women, mm -hmm. to protect the elderly. So yeah, damn it, I'm telling, I'm snitching, I'm telling on your punk ass. Because if you would do that to a woman, you, you, there's no honor in you. So yes. that's the difference, excuse my language, I'm a preacher, but, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I got a cop's mouth. But my point is this, is that when you care about your community, you protect those, particularly those that are the most vulnerable. So to my black brothers and sisters, we owe it to protect our sisters. If you know that there's a rapist out there, somebody bragging about raping somebody, you turn that punk in. That's what you do. That's not snitching. So snitching is when we do a dirt together and I tell on you, that's snitching. That's what I want you guys to know. I say this all the time, but I wanted to make sure I was the only person that thought that way. Yeah. Now this is the dirty little secret though. Uh, for all them cats that are threatening you talking about, they don't snitch. Oh, they all snitch. <laughs> as soon as the prosecutor lay that charge in front of them, they find out how much time they're going to get. They Sing start like snitching. Oh, my goodness. They like the bird. More homicides get closed. More armed robberies get closed. More bank robberies get closed. More crack you houses get closed. You said on first 48. Down. Oh, yes. Ray Ray can't wait until I'm Can't there. wait to tell. <laughs> sit there for a minute, slump down, and then he find out how much time he's going to do. So, you know, even that quote unquote no snitch code, it don't really exist. Not exactly. Those doors. Okay. So my next question mm -hmm. is, if you were still in office, because so many have, so many people have different opinions on uh, James Gray mm -hmm. for different reasons. But if you were still in office, what what would you have done differently, mm -hmm. or if you have, what would you be doing right now? What do you think the state of crime would be now? Uh, I think it, I think it would be low. Um, and I, I, I don't. I, let me put it this way: James Craig and I are not in competition. Uh, I think he's a tremendous chief of police. He brings a lot of experience. He brought a different set of eyes coming from uh, uh, Los Angeles, then to um, Portland, Maine, and eventually chief in Cincinnati, then coming back home to Detroit. Uh, he brought a different set of eyes, a different set of experiences. So I see him as building on the successes that I started, and then I built on the success that Warren Evans. I mean, we we're, you know, it's not a competition. You know, the media tries to make it a competition. But I think what I would have done differently um, you know, knowing what I know now, I would spend much more time, and I spent a lot of time in community relations, uh, but I, was, I, I would have invested so heavily in making sure that our officers uh, got a chance to know the people in the community, and then making those connections with young black men. Uh, I, I, I made a number of visits to uh, Mile Road when it was actually a state correctional mm -hmm. facility. I've been to Jackson, when I was chief of police, and I actually went behind um, those prison walls to talk to the men particularly black men, and let them know I love you, and when you get out of here, I don't want you to come back. Because 90% of people that are incarcerated, they're coming home. And if they feel like they're coming home, and that they're already viewed as a criminal, they're not given another chance, then they get to a point where if they can't get a job, the education system is jacked up, they don't have a set of skills, 
that would help them not recidivate, then guess what? You're gonna go back to what you know to feed yourself and survive. So I would have spent a lot more time with former citizens, uh, even much more than I did, and working on making sure that when they came home, that they had a, you know, a safety net, a true rehabilitation. But some of them are not being rehabilitated because if you have that net, some of them are being habilitated. Because if you go in with drug issues, you go in with uh, mental health issues, you go in with trauma, you think you're coming out better? No, it, they, they, you, sometimes you, you learn how to be a better criminal you while you're there. Mm -hmm. So I think the community and particularly police departments have to understand that that quote unquote soft side of crime that's the prevention part. Today's intervention is tomorrow's prevention. So we gotta grab those brothers that are incarcerated. Number one, let them know we love them, that they can be a part of this community when they come back. But then when they come back, don't just throw them out there and say, now do good. Well, no, give them the resources to do Yeah, so you so throw them to the wolves. Throw them to the wolves and then wonder why they, they, they recidivate. So that, you know, I think that's a huge, huge part where law enforcement falls short. I agree. So now that you're not in law enforcement mm -hmm. anymore, so now you're teaching at WC3. I teach at Wayne County Community College in the criminal justice program. So what are you doing now as far as the war on crime? Um, educate. Uh, and then I, I, I consider myself a political activist. Uh, I do a lot on Facebook Live. I formerly hosted a radio program uh, five days a week where I talked about these very issues. Uh, I like to really talk about the political infrastructure, educate, particularly people of color because a lot of the crime issues the police can't fix. A lot of them are systemic issues that really go to systemic racism, and in some cases, the vestiges of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we're only 50 years away from uh, the civil rights movement uh, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge when John Lewis, who um, the current president, uh, lambasted it and said he's done nothing. John Lewis almost lost his life, literally, uh, fighting for the rights of black and brown Americans to be counted as equals in this country. And there is a study that was done uh, on, on trauma victims and post-traumatic stress. And the doctor, his name is Bessel van der Kolk, did some research. And they found that third, fourth, fifth generation survivors of the Holocaust suffered trauma. Wow. And they weren't the ones that were actually incarcerated and gassed and and going through the atrocities that their parents and forefathers went through. But that trauma gets passed down. So it's not unreasonable to think that we're only 50 years away uh, from you know, uh, the serious civil rights movement, even though we're still fighting for certain rights, that there's trauma in our communities. A black person, when they see red and blue lights in their rear view mirror, Scared. there's a trauma that sets in. This is true. Versus the white person who, Hey, when you pulling me over for four, buddy? I pay my tax. You know, what did I do? You know, like yes, ambassador. Yeah, right. Asking you my ID. You know, but you know, the black person, it can literally be life or death because of that encounter. And that's, it's definitely that, frightening, even that, for me as a woman. When oh, I see the police, I'm mentally nervous. I'm like sweating. It, it, it's not just you know uh, unarmed black men that have died at the you know hands of the police. Then we look at Sandra Bland. Right. And her her unnecessary incarceration. Number one, how the officer escalated. it. Whether you believe in the theory that the police harmed her while she was in custody or if she actually committed suicide, it doesn't matter. If she wasn't in custody, she would not have died there, period. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, a, it's not just a male issue, it's not just an old man issue, or it's not just a young man issue. It is a cultural issue that this country has got to get its arms around. What do you think those steps are? Uh, first of all, I was talking about having honest conversations. But I think the second thing is that black police officers have to realize that they have a role in this too. Malcolm and Medgar and Martin and Rosa, they didn't do all that they did for us to, Cole and Young, mm -hmm. to occupy these positions for us to do the same thing to our people that the majority population was doing. So I, it ain't that I'm giving you a break, but it's like, brother, I understand, I've been there. I grew up on the east side. I'm not gonna try and ruin your life over a broken tail like and then start you down this process of first it's a broken tail light. Then there's no proof of insurance. So now I've criminalized you being poor. So now you got to choose between driving, riding dirty to get to work, to feed your kids, or do I stay home and get fired? Or if I'm late catching the bus that don't come on time in Detroit and I get fired, now I'm exacerbating my own problem. So now I got to make a calculated decision. 
I'm gonna take a chance and drive with bad insurance and this bogus license plate just so I can get to work mm -hmm. so I can feed my children. But when I get caught now, it starts me down that cycle. So now really we, 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 we have become a party to criminalizing being poor and criminalizing being, just by being black. Did you always have that way of thinking? Nope, you? I did not. When I came to the police department, and once I, you know, after I sobered up and figured out I'm gonna do this, uh, I want to catch the bad guy. I want to get guns off the street. I'm going to save Detroit. And I didn't realize because I wasn't old enough. I wasn't grown enough. I hadn't uh, learned That's enough serious. to understand that systemic racism was real. And in a lot of instances, law enforcement is one of the tools that helps to keep it perpetuated. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes very, very undercover. And the insurance thing is one that really is horrific. Because now if you live in the city of Detroit, all this Detroit has come back. Hey, I love downtown, I love midtown, but Detroit ain't back. It won't be back until Mac and Bewick is back. It ain't gonna be back until Linwood and Philadelphia is back. Yes. It ain't gonna be back until Joy Road is back. So when those areas are back and you can walk the streets and there's shopping on those streets and the buses come on time and there's a neighborhood school that the kid can go to without fearing being shot and without going past abandoned houses or, or roads where there are, I mean, places where there used to be houses, it's like one open house field. on the block, yes. open field. That's Mac and Bewick. Oh my goodness. You know, that's when Detroit can say it's come back. So, you know, all that downtown and midtown, that's for the rich folks. You know, that's so, the playground for the rich. So speaking of living in Detroit, mm -hmm. the feeling of having these police officers who are from outside the city, mm -hmm. do you feel like they don't appreciate the community and the citizens as much as the people that, that are from mm -hmm. the city that got down and buried in the city to say, I'm going to pick my community up together versus just coming to collect a paycheck? I'll put it this way. Um, there are officers that don't live in the city of Detroit. They put it down every day and they do a hell of a job. They do a good job. Some of them have even paid the ultimate price and lost their life in the line of duty. So anybody that puts that badge on, they lift their right hand, they take that over. Mm -hmm. I, I, I give them all the honor for that. However, it is impossible to believe that you have the same vested interest in the community that you live in than one you don't. Because when I was a police officer and I came on a job in 1987, you had to live in the city of Detroit. But the cool part about that is my neighbors on Cedar Grove, uh, my neighbors on Dean and Stockton, my neighbors uh, when I lived on Eastburn, um, they always knew that, you know, I don't know if I like cops, but Ralph is cool because that's my neighbor. So number one, from a community relations standpoint, I'm familiar to this person. I'm not just this guy with a badge and a gun. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, have a beer together at the barbecue, you know. Oh, it's a real dude. Oh, we know his daughter. You know, we know his wife. You know, we're, he come to the block club meeting. We're family. But when you are, 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 are removed and you don't have, you know, we shop, you know, I can run up. I, I may pull you over for a ticket, but I ain't going to clap on you because we may shop at the same spot. Or we may end up, you know, um, uh, you know going to the same a, 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 a barber. I mean, there's so many things that we do in common together that when you move out of the community, you don't have that 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 connection. I agree. And then plus, if there's a crime that goes on my block, guess who they gonna call? <laughs> or if I see it, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call the dispatcher. Say, hey, can you get a car over here? And guess what they gonna do? They gonna take care of their own. So, and then there's another aspect to it. You erode your own tax base when you ain't paying taxes, property taxes in the city that you work for. So when all those cops moved out of the city of Detroit, they took tax revenue with them. Mm -hmm. And now the tax revenue that, you know, Detroit was getting from you living there, well, you know, Clinton Township, well, that's why they malls look so nice on M59, because you got cop money out there. That makes so much sense. And then the, the, the last aspect of that is, how do I even vote for the person that is going to run the police department, which is the mayor? You can't even vote in the community you don't live in. So you can complain about the mayor all you want, but the person that is actually going to make the decisions about the, the, the law enforcement product, the direction of your career, you can't even vote for because you don't even live in the same city of your boss. Wow. So for me, even when they lifted residency in 1999, I stayed in the city until um, I retired. Then I stayed even a couple of years, well, about a year after that before I actually moved out of the city. Um, and that's just because I found some good deals on some real estate. I love Detroit, but hey. It's cheap. I, I get it. So moving past that, I know that you're a preacher. Mm -hmm. And because of your faith, do you think that, that the godly influence 
in the community or in the world in general? Do you think that that affects things when it comes to crime and morals and values? Uh, I don't care how saved you are. If your babies are hungry, you're going to do what's necessary to feed your babies. It's a lot of people in jail that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. It's a lot of people in jail uh, that believe that Muhammad is the true prophet and they uh, subscribe to uh, Islam. So it's not a matter of your, you know, your faith that causes crime all the time. A lot of times crime is a measure of conditions. And if I can't eat, even the Bible contemplates that if a man steals to feed his family, you don't put him in jail, but you make him pay recompense if it's for a reason that makes sense. And you got a lot, a lot of people that are incarcerated, not necessarily because they're hard criminals, they're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. So when you have a school system in Detroit that has been completely raped by the Republicans uh, for over 13 years, and every bit of resources that were in there were taken out, and it all went to the money and the contracts and how the contracts were let out. Uh, and Jennifer Granholm has to hold some accountability for that as well. Because when she was yes. governor, she brought the first emergency manager in. Um, and it was all about the contracts and a $1.5 billion bond issue and who was getting the money. Well, the, the black run city of Detroit was make sure that black owned businesses and, and, and Detroit based businesses were getting that business and they decided, wait a minute, we got to spread this money out. And, you know, so that was the real genesis of the change in the school system. I say that to say anywhere you see a high rate of illiteracy, you're going to see a, a commiserate rate of crime. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if, if you're not educated, then your chances of a job or a well-paying job, it goes down. I'm not talk, necessarily talking about college education, but vocational, uh, basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. If you can't do those things, then you become, you're not employable. And if you're not employable, then, you know, sometimes a drug dealer is, is the only employer in some of these uh, neighborhoods. And now you have to turn to a life of crime for survival as opposed to you necessarily being a hardened criminal. And it just exacerbates the situation when you get men that are pulled out of the community. And, you know, that absence of men, now you have boys trying to fill men, men's roles. And they haven't really been, you know, properly taught, you know, how to be a man. Yes. You know, like I said, when I was a kid, the gang members wouldn't let me be in the gang. Um, but you had the OGs that kind of, you know, there was a there was an ethic around even the criminal aspect in our communities. You know, a lot of people got pissed off, and, and basically the um, uh, the political types, uh, when New Era Detroit talked about the street code. But they were absolutely correct. Even if you look in, in the majority community, in, in the in the Italian community. Uh, La Cosa Nostra, uh, the, the Mafia, they, had, they, they would not, you would be killed if you sold dope to another Italian. As a matter of fact, they would say this, and excuse my language, would say, you can sell dope to the niggas, but you don't sell dope. You, uh, the, the Mafia would kill you, mm -hmm. if you if you hurt your own people. Mm -hmm. So there were honor, there's a term called honor among thieves. You don't hurt old people, you don't hurt kids, you don't, wives and families are not involved in this. But when you have kids with no leadership, even in crime, and this is going to sound crazy, but even in crime, you need to have leadership. Because even crime at its basic essence is a money-making venture. You can't make money when there's chaos. And that's what's happening in Detroit. You got a lot of unorganized, you don't have formal gangs like uh, the, um, YPI. Yeah, you know, YPI. I mean, it was a structure, you know, piece of work on the Curry Boys and, um, White Boy Rick and those cats, uh, Maserati Rick. I mean, there was, a def there, there, there was a defined culture, but there was a hierarchy. You knew who was in charge. You knew where you could run dope and where you couldn't. And if somebody got killed, I guarantee you there was a direct link to messing up somebody's business. It wasn't just random, everybody thugged out. You know, that, that's, that, that wasn't the case then. Um, so uh, there is a place for organization in crime. Which a lot of a lot of cops are not going to talk about that. No. With this, you know, uh, but you have to realize it's realistic. Though. It's realistic. I mean, crime is not new. Crime has been around ever since, man. Since you, if you go biblically, you know, going back to um, a Cain, you know, the first homicide, <laughs> right. you know, when he killed his brother. So you know, we're not going to eradicate crime, but we can manage the issues that cause crime much better. And a lot of them are socioeconomic. It doesn't really matter if, I, if Jim Craig is chief, I'm chief, uh, if my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is chief. If we don't change on the ground, 
uh, the dynamics for the people that live in our communities. Um, we're going to continue to have the crime issues in Detroit, Chicago. Uh, it all goes to the same um, disenfranchisement of poor people. What can we do as citizens to change this? Uh, we have to be more politically savvy and start to ask the right questions. Um, I understand that it's important. It's important to be engaged. Um, I know people want to give up and say, you know, politics. But don't be afraid of politics. If you look at the etymology of the word politics, politics comes from a Greek word that means to influence. Everybody's a politician. So you know all this, well, I'm not a politician. Yes, you are, because the politics is about influencing certain people to a way of thinking. And if the community is really organized, if the community sticks together, if the community knows what it wants, and then you're going to have people getting paid off and bought off you know, for a, a, a cheap job to come in and tell you, yeah, he OK. Well, no, we don't need that. We need more people that will stay engaged in the process and demand more from the politicians. The politicians act like, you know, it's a pleasure for us to be in their presence now. But they work for us. Right. And we got to get rid of this, you know, worship of politicians and really demand that they serve the people that elect them to their office. And when they don't, get rid of them. Get to the polls. And, and, and you know, out of all of the consternation about Donald Trump's presidency, you know, some of these folks that figured they were going to protest by not voting, look where it got you. You're being a rebel for nothing. At that, at that mm -hmm. point, it's, I'm just being a rebel because I think because it's cute. Uh, yeah, because I think it's And cute. so many mm -hmm. black people, I think, are politically mm -hmm. uneducated. They are politically uneducated. It's not just black people, though. It's a lot, yeah. Because if you look at the whole Donald Trump phenomenon, it's a whole bunch of white people that's voted The rural Americans. Mm -hmm. They voted completely against their interest. Yes. Uh, because we get caught up into you know believing and accepting what the media tells us. You know, it's like I, it's like the word is bond. Yes, the word is bond. I, I was indoctrinated. I was taught. I was raised by my dad that you know I, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm going to teach you how to think. And that's what we have to get back to as a people. Stop telling people what to think, who to like. You know, even being a Democrat or a Republican, it's some Democrats that have sold black folks down the river, but and there's some Republicans that have done some good stuff for black folks. But we have become so engaged in this just pick a side. Well, I can't pick a side of both sides wrong. I'm calling them out like the umpire. So if, it, if it's a Democrat that's going against black folks, I'm going to call you out. If it's a Republican, I'm going to call you out. And, and we got to get back to that kind of activism and be more educated before we give our vote to anybody. In one sense, that's where Donald Trump did resonate with black folks. The Democrats have taken your vote for, for granted. And it's absolutely true. They have. They figured black folks going to line up as long as we say the right thing. But they did a damn thing. This is a great interview. I appreciate Any final you. words? Uh, no, I just appreciate the Elmatic view. I appreciate you for coming through. And this uh, is great. It, it, this is awesome. But so I, I, I do want to say this, though. Yes. I'm very proud of you as a, a young queen. Thank you. Uh, that is doing your thing. Uh, you, you're young. You're enjoying your life. But also, you're raising a social consciousness. So I'm, I, I, anything I can do for the Elmatic view uh, to contribute to the conversation, I'm certainly glad to do so. That means a lot. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. This will be posted very soon. I have many more interviews like this coming up. I don't panel discussions coming up too for um, me and women. Um, I'm going to speak on my next topic will be um, mental illness in the black community because that's something that we don't talk about, that we don't recognize. And with so many things that's going on um, in America, that's something that we have to speak of. So. Once again, I appreciate you, Mr. Gabby. This was great. Thanks for tuning in to the Elmanic View. And subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. See you soon.